take your Bibles, if you will, this morning and open to uh, Exodus chapter uh, 24. Exodus chapter 24. I know it's in my Bible somewhere. There it is, right after 23. <clears throat> wow, I haven't needed this in a long time. <laughs> the fan is my friend. <laughs> All right, Exodus chapter 24. Now, uh, you know, there's some uh, things in life that, uh, quite frankly, we just enjoy doing. Amen? Uh, obviously, I know for uh, Brother Dave and some others, fishing is one of them. Uh, for me, uh, scuba diving. But there's just... There's things in life, I know my wife likes to sew, some people like to paint, draw, garden, uh, you, you go down the list, there's a, a thousand different things uh, that, that people like to do. And uh, as we get into the book of Exodus here, we know that the story pretty much revolves around the beginning of Exodus and, and Exodus of the children of Israel leaving Egypt under Pharaoh, right? So we're all very familiar with that story, we've heard it, I'm, I'm sure, since we were children. Uh, this morning, I just want to take a look at a portion of it and uh, maybe just note a couple of things that, to me anyway, I think are a comfort and a delight. Uh, hopefully, maybe there's a, a thing or two in here that uh, maybe is new to you that you didn't quite realize about the Bible, and you can go away having both learned something and been encouraged. Amen? Amen. So uh, we go to Exodus chapter 24, and <clears throat> again, I'm thinking about uh, what's happening here in the book of Exodus. I'm thinking about the Lord uh, bringing his people out and the, all those things are running through the, you know, the back of my mind. I'm thinking about uh, enjoying life and quite frankly, there's just, there's some things uh, when it comes to men and when it comes to God that, that we just enjoy, that we find entertaining, that we find comforting. There's some things that, that give us um, rest and hope and peace. And there's some things that give us, quite frankly, delight. And I just titled this message here this morning, God's Delight. There's just a few things as I was running through the, uh, the book of Exodus here and uh, some parts in, in the book of Exodus that, you know, just kind of reminded me that God delights in some things this morning, just like we do in, in life. Amen. The, I mean, the beautiful weather outside, like I said, I was uh, lamenting the fact that I don't have all my scuba gear ready to go because I'd really love to go jump in the lake. I realized the ice was off the, the lakes like that. So I'm going to have to get all that ready. But there's some things that I uh, delight in. But there's some things that, that God delights in. And uh, the Bible says in, um, in Psalm 18, he brought me forth also into a large place. And then it says this, he delivered me because he delighted in me. I tell you, as I uh, go through the book of Exodus, again, the major theme being God taking the nation of Israel out of the land of Egypt, one of the things that can't help but cross my mind is, you know what? The Lord had to take great delight in delivering his people out from under the hand of Pharaoh. Amen. I mean, you think about that. You, you think about God looking down and, and seeing the oppression that his people were under, and watching them, you know, make bricks, and then they, uh, they took the straw away, and they had to go get their own straw. You know the whole story. I mean, the, the children of Israel were in Egypt. And, of course, Pharaoh decided that he was a little afraid because they were getting to be too many. And what does he do? He has all the male children killed that were, uh, you know, in the land of Egypt. And he uh, has that little powwow with the midwives and has all of them, uh, or at least commands all of them, to kill all the children that are in the... Uh, or that are born in Egypt. Now, that's what God is sitting up there watching his people go through for the better part of 400 years they were in Egypt. Now, I know at the beginning it didn't start off that bad. At the beginning it may have been a little bit of reprieve, but isn't the world kind of like that? We know Egypt is a type of the world. In the beginning, it seems like it's not too bad, but as time goes on, the, the grip gets tighter. Right? And, and the, the, the squeezing gets more pronounced. And, and the world just kind of grabs a hold of you. And before you know it, you're bound in a place and you're in, you're in slavery. And you're having to work. And the Lord, the Lord, one of the things the Lord takes great delight in is the Lord takes delight in, in delivering his people. Um, 
Some people try to give our God a bad reputation. Some people blame God for many things, quite frankly, that God didn't do. Amen? Um, some people uh, don't really understand that when God does allow evil, evil being a, a tragedy, a bad thing, according to Bible definition, a hurricane would be evil. Um, uh, when, when, when God does allow a bad thing to happen, an evil thing to happen, listen, it is usually after a very long period of patience and long suffering at the hands of our God. God watched Pharaoh and how he treated his people, his children, for nearly 400 years in that country before he brought the plagues and got them out of the land of Egypt. God is a merciful God. God is long-suffering. God is patient. But um, listen, by far, as you, as you scan through the Bible, you see time and time and time again where God takes de great delight in delivering his people from their bondage. Amen? Amen. Um, like I said, God takes, takes great delight in delivering his people from, from all kinds of trouble. We are, um, we're known for, you know, we're known for getting ourselves in trouble and, uh, you know, making a mess of things in life. There is a, um, there's an organization uh, that's, it's actually called Free Burma Rangers. And they go around, they do some charitable work. It's supposed to be a Christian-based organization. And they were over in Iraq. And uh, Dave uh, um, Eubank right here is one of the members of that organization, a former uh, military member. And they were under the fire of, uh, or there was a town that was under the fire of, of ISIS. ISIS had come in and was, uh, was firing on this town. And there were about 50, 60-ish uh, people that were laying on the, on the ground dead. I didn't have, want to put those pictures up there. They're there. But it was a massacre. It was a massacre. And they were just sitting back, picking off people one after another, just civilians in the town. And we know the things that are going on over that time, or over in that part of the, the country. And um, uh, Dave uh, Eubank was over there with this group, this uh, uh, Free Burma Rangers group. And they were out doing humanitarian work and trying to, you know, to, to lend aid wherever they could. And while they had a, an association, at least in contact with the Iraqi military and the American military. They're not really a military organization, uh, but most of them are former military. And they had, those, uh, they had those people who were pinned down and they were firing upon them. And, and Dave got there and he, he analyzed that situation and he realized in the midst of all those dead bodies, there were a few people still alive out there. You know, that's kind of like, <laughs> I'm sure that's what the Lord looks at when he looks at the world. You know, there's a lot of people that are spiritually dead, but in the midst of all that carnage, there's a few people that are still alive out there. And, and Dave, uh, you know, Dave and his, his troops were, were kind of pinned down. They couldn't go out in there because of the heavy fire. It was, it was a suicide to run out there. They were about 150 yards away from uh, this group of people. And what they wound up doing is they wound up calling in uh, the U.S. military and some Iraqi help, and they, the U.S. military sent in a smoke screen and they wound up getting behind this Iraqi tank and running out and checking to see and trying to capture these survivors and, and rescue these survivors and, and pull them out of this carnage. And one of the survivors was this little girl. He got out there in the middle of that whole thing and he, and he realized what's going on. He knew his life was in, in danger and jeopardy. And he got out there and he heard this little girl crying. And he looked over and she was under her mother, who had been shot. And he ran out from behind that tank and grabbed her with, with gunshots and fire going all over the place and got, got her back and, and safely was able to rescue her and get her back to a safe place. And she's alive now because of it. Don't you know when, you know, and he was sitting there and thinking about it, he, he thought this. He thought, you know what, if I get killed doing this, certainly my family would understand. What is he an example of? He's an example of somebody that takes delight in delivering somebody that's helpless. Amen? Listen, that's our God. Our God takes the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he delivers them out from some circumstances that are, that are horrific for them. But, but the Lord's not done with 
just Egypt. He delivers people time and time and time again. The Lord, in fact, it happens so often in the Bible, I just kind of come to the conclusion, I think the Lord takes delight in delivering people. Amen? I think the Lord takes great delight in uh, delivering people. I think of, um, uh, here's a picture of uh, the group of those folks that helped get that little girl out. I think the Lord takes delight. When I think of um, uh, the fiery furnace, right? When I think of the fiery furnace and those, uh, those three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, and the Lord steps in and he delivers them out of the fiery furnace. Right? It says in Daniel 3.17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he did. I think of Daniel in the lion's den. And, um, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar came to that den and he said when, when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable, vo lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, a servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions. And he was. And he was. And you know what? The Lord is interested in delivering you also. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Now, I don't know what it is you need to be delivered from. I just know that I have a God who takes great delight in delivering folks from things like, like torment, things like trouble, right? Right? Uh, in John 4, 6, it says the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him out of his grief. The Lord looks at his servant down there and, and Jonah, and Jonah didn't have a great track record up to this point. He kind of even had a bad attitude about things. But he was sitting down there in grief and it was a hot day. It was in the sun and the Lord had enough you know, compassion to look down on him and just, huh, let's grow a gourd leaf and give him a little bit of shade. I find that comforting. I find it a great comfort that the Lord looks down on his people, on his children especially, but even lost folks, to be perfectly honest with you. And quite often, the Lord takes delight in delivering them from their trouble, from their, from their torment. The Lord, the Lord is, is that kind of a God. He just he establishes himself as, as that kind of God. Um, it says in Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I take note that the Lord is, is a, a God that delivers his people from their fears. Take a look at Exodus chapter 24. We never really um, started to read that passage. <clears throat> but uh, it says in Exodus chapter 24, And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, and Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall uh, not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with them. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote the words of the Lord. You know the story. Uh, down in verse 6, he took half of the blood, put it on the basins. They are offering sacrifice. In verse 7, he took the book. So we don't have the Ten Commandments yet. He's writing all these things down in a book. I find that kind of interesting and, and noteworthy. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in, um, and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. <clears throat> and then we run across a passage here in Exodus um, 24 that maybe you don't remember as part of the main story. But look at verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. So this is after he read the book. Nadab, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Moses, and 70. That's 74 people, right? And they saw the God of Israel. Amen. See, we remember no, Moses going up and seeing the God of Israel. 
We remember the people at the base of the mountain looking up and seeing the fire and the smoke and the lightnings and being afraid and terrified of the God of Israel. But how many of you remember that it wasn't just Moses? There were 74 people, including Moses, that got to go up and they saw the God of Israel. And in case there's any doubt about that, there was, uh, and there was under his feet, so they saw his feet, as it were a paved work of sapphire stone, as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. The Lord, in the process of delivering the nation of Israel, took 74 people up on that mountain, and they all got to see him. Amen. We remember the bad things sometimes, right? The golden calf, and that's coming up in a few chapters, and I, I get all that. But before any of that happened, it wasn't just Moses. Listen, it was 74 people that got to go up and see God. Now, I'll grant you, they didn't get to see him quite the way Moses got to see him. Moses was something special, and Moses came back, and his face, you know, shone, and the whole thing, and I, I got that. But man, wouldn't you have liked to have been one of those 74? Wouldn't you have liked to have been one of those 74 that got to travel up that mountain and see God, at least in some form? I know they didn't see him, you know, in his full glory, but they got to see enough of him that it was counted that they saw God. The Lord is in the middle of delivering his people out of the nation of Egypt. He's got them wandering around through the desert. He's getting ready to give them the Ten Commandments. He's getting ready to make this whole pack with them. And he takes the time to let these guys come up and just get a glimpse of him. See, the Lord, the Lord is good. The Lord likes to deliver his people. It says in, uh, in 2 Peter 2, 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the... Uh, the godly out of temptations. Listen, you're, you're sitting here this morning, you're a Christian, you're, you're struggling with temptations. Listen, I got a God that delights in giving you a way out of your temptations. Amen. I have a God that knows how to deliver you out of your temptations. And he, when I read through the Bible, I see him act, interact with his people and prove this, this principle over and over and over and over. Somebody gets themselves in trouble, God sends a deliverer. God gives them a way out. Somebody is in torment, uh, Jonah and the gourd. God gives them a way out. How many times, um, you know, you think about those, the maniac of uh, Gadara and some of the other men in the New Testament that were, um, you know, that were devil-possessed and the things that they went through and, and the Lord gave them a way out. The Lord delivered them. He takes delight in delivering people. Listen, I don't know where you stand here this morning I don't know if you're lost or saved. I know most of you are saved because, of, you know, we've, you have a testimony. You've told me before. But maybe there's somebody here this morning who's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Listen, one of the first things that you need to know about God is that he delights in delivering people out of their trouble. You see, in the Bible, there's a heaven and there's a hell and there is no other place once you die. Right? And we know, you know, we know from the story of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and that thing brought on a curse to all of mankind that we're all under right now. And you know what the Lord did, even back there in the garden? He took delight in shedding the blood of an animal to pay for Adam and Eve's sin. He stepped right in and gave them a way out. Listen, I don't know if you're lost here this morning, but if you're lost here this morning... <clears throat> One of the things I can promise you is that the Lord would take great delight in delivering you from the hands of the devil. See, in the New Testament, the Bible, in talking about lost people, said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. If you're lost here this morning, you probably find that more true than false. Right? Sometimes if you're saved here this morning, you struggle with that a little bit as well. But you have a different father. And the Lord would love nothing more than to deliver you out of the hand of the devil as far as salvation. Amen. Amen? The Lord likes to deliver out of trouble, out of torment, out of temptation. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver. 
God delivers. And it makes him happy. It gives him great delight. Listen, if you're lost here this morning, what do you have to look forward to? I mean, seriously. You say, I'm going to have some fun down here on the earth when I'm partying. Okay, that can end in a heartbeat. <laughs> what then? If you're saved here this morning, we go through this thing and, and you know, again, we're, this life we live is, is, is pictured in the children of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt. Listen, what is it that you have to look forward to? Because the Lord delights in helping you out of your troubles, delivering you out of the things that you're struggling with. But sometimes people don't listen. Sometimes people don't want to be delivered. I was thinking about this. The Lord takes the nation of Israel out of Egypt. 74 of them get to go up that mountain and see God. Fast forward a little bit. We're going to go do the whole Ten Commandments thing. Moses, you know, goes up the mountain to get the Ten, uh, uh, the ten Commandments a little bit later. And, and he goes up there alone with Joshua, right? So Joshua's not in that 74. That means there's 73, not just Aaron, but there's 73 guys back in the camp that have seen God when they make that golden calf. That's pretty, that, that blows my mind. 73 people, you mean to tell me not even, not even Aaron stood up and stood up for God after having been there up on that mountain and seeing God. 73 of them let that whole process happen with the golden calf. So you move that into 21st century Christianity. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen God work? Certainly you can probably think of something. You can attribute to the workings of God. You know what God loves to do? He loves to deliver his people. But you know what happens sometimes is even though a whole bunch of his people have seen something very special, when the chips are down, they fail in the test. <clears throat> 73 of them let that golden calf, not one of them stood up and said to Aaron, <clears throat> Aaron, don't you remember what we just did a few days ago back there when we were up on the mountain? Don't you remember what we saw? Don't you dare be making that golden calf. And it was only 40 days. It wasn't that long since they had seen it. What do I know about God? I know that God delights in delivering his people even sometimes when his people don't want to be delivered. Amen. Amen. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. I better move on. I'll tell you another thing I, I run across reading this passage of Scripture. It says there in uh, Exodus chapter 24, verse 9, Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw God, the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, paved work of sapphire stone, as it um, as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. I'll tell you another thing the Lord takes great delight in, folks, and that is dining with his people. <laughs> He takes delight in delivering you, absolutely. But you know what else he takes great delight in? Listen, the Lord takes great delight when he can come, metaphorically, and sit down with you at the table. Sit across. I mean, what do people do when they, you know, typically start uh, thinking about the possibility of marriage? Hey, would you like to go out to lunch? Hey, would you like to go out to dinner? Why? Because you get a chance to sit. There's something about sitting across the table from somebody at a meal and just having a conversation. You learn things, right? 
you learn things about each other. You, you sit there and you talk, if you're not constantly doing this, that would be a 21st century thing. <laughs> But there's something about sitting down and having a meal with somebody. Uh, you know, you have a good friend you haven't seen for a long time. Hey, let's get together for lunch sometime. It's just a natural part of our, our makeup. And the Lord, the Lord uh, takes these, these 74 guys that go up this mountain and they get a chance to sit down and eat and drink. The Lord, the Lord is interested in having some personal time with them. And you know what? The Lord's interested in having some personal time with you. Those 70 saw, and, but they also sat down and ate and drank with the Lord. I remember um, uh, in Genesis 18, Abraham, Sarah are out in the middle of the desert, and those three men come by, and it was the Lord, the angel of the Lord, and, and, and two other men with him, right? What's the first thing that Abraham did? He looks over at Sarah. Hey, Sarah, go make some bread. I'm going to go kill a fatted calf. Let's get these men in here and have a meal. And they all sit down together and they dine one with another. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad that the Lord delivered me from my sins on Calvary. Amen? Amen. When I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I am thankful that the Lord delivered me from my sins. I don't have to worry about hell anymore. He's taken me out of that bondage. That thing is long gone. It's put away. My sins are paid for. And I have an eternal home in heaven guaranteed. But there's more than that. Because the Lord has a desire to take me, and you know what? Hey, Bob, how about let's get together for lunch once in a while? Amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, the Lord, the Lord has this desire, folks, to know you. I mean, I know he already knows you, but to know you better. And more importantly, for you to know him better. And you see it happen over and over and over in the scriptures. First thing Abraham does when the Lord, angel of the Lord comes walking by. Hey, let's have, let's have a meal. All right? Uh, in the New Testament, Peter, after the resurrection, Peter denied the, denied the Lord three times. The Lord's been crucified, resurrected. Peter goes out. I go a fishing. Remember the story, right? Gets out there, catch no fish. Dude on the shore. Hey, casting it on the other side, on the right side of the boat. Casting it on the right side of the boat. Ah, oh, it's the Lord. Voila, big revelation. What does he say? That's Bob's version. <laughs> what does he say? Come and dine. Yes. You realize after Peter denied the Lord three times and felt about this high, what the Lord desired to do with him is to sit down with him and have a meal. See, I find great comfort in that. I find great comfort in that one of the greatest examples of, of, you know, rejecting the Lord that you and I think of when we think of, oh, yeah, Peter denied the Lord three times. That thing comes off the tip of our tongue. Peter's got to be up there every time a sermon is preached upon that going, oh, Lord. <laughs> when we get to the millennium, can you just erase that portion of scripture out of the Bible? Because I really feel bad that I did that. And the Lord's going to go, no, Pete, uh, yeah, it's going to help keep you humble. You're going to have to remember, yes, you did that. Okay, Lord. And you know what Pete's probably thinking? He's probably thinking, well, you know what? If my, if my error will help encourage some saint down there on that earth from making the same mistake, to keep them from making the same mistake, he said, it's worth it. I'll pay the price. Yeah. Yeah. But, the, but Peter messed up and, and, you know, he feels about a half an inch high. And the, and the first thing the Lord does when he sees him, obviously he tells him to fish on the right side of the boat. They get a lot of fish. But he tells him, come and dine. How much have you dined with the Lord this week? Right? You see, I, I mean, we know that that uh, Abraham tells Sarah what? Hey, go bake some bread. We got some guests coming. We know in the Bible, the Bible is what? The bread of life. Yeah. And you know what the Lord desires more than anything else for us? To come and dine and partake of that bread. And we got that little jar back there going, right? And hopefully everyone hasn't forgotten about it because I notice it is getting a little higher. But we got that little jar back there, and what we decided to do is just throw pennies in for, if you read a chapter, throw a penny in. 
Why? I, just something to do. Just every time I walk in here, I look at that jar and I think, hmm, how many pennies do I got to throw in now? <laughs> it's just a reminder. What is it a reminder of? The reminder is the Lord wants you to spend time in that book. The Lord spiritually wants you and I to spend time in that Bible so that we can sit down at the table with him and dine. The Lord takes great delight in dining with his people. And the Lord will take great delight in you sitting down. Everyone's schedule is crazy and hectic. I got it. All right, read a little bit. Do what I do. I cheat. I got my Bible on my phone. <laughs> don't tell me you don't have time to read some of your phones. <laughs> right? I got my Bible on my phone. No problem. I sit at work. I pull it up and I go, ah. And I, I got this little color scheme that I mark, you know, <laughs> mark verses off so I know what I've read and what I haven't read. I just highlight them. I got a certain color code, okay? This, this is the ones I've read. Man, the Bible on the phone. You know what the Lord wants you to do? Come and die. Why? Because he takes great delight in it. He takes those 70 guys up on the mountain. and I don't know for whatever reason. I don't know how many times I've read Exodus. I've read Exodus, I don't know, a lot of times. I'd forgotten 70 guys went up there and saw the Lord. I'm probably not the only one. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are thinking back, oh, I remembered that. What's the matter with you, preacher? We're going to get somebody else. <laughs> For whatever reason, it just, it just gets, skipped my mind. I'm going, wow, these guys got to see the Lord and then got to dine with him. And the Lord takes delight in that. Every time you open that Bible app on your phone and you start reading, the Lord takes delight. Every time you sit down with that book and you turn the pages and you hear the, the paper crinkle and you make all little marks in it and, you know, I can mark up my, you know, I had, I, I had the, phone, uh, the Bible on my phone all marked up and highlighted and everything. And then I got a new phone. I realized, oh, when I move the program over, I lose all that. <laughs> Bummer. It's blank. Time to start over again. Okay, start marking it up again. Oh, well. But the paper copy stays pretty marked up. So Peter says, I go a fishing. Man, I, I better hurry. It says uh, in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door... And knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and do what? Sup with him. I'll come in and I'll have dinner with you. Why? Because he takes great delight in it. Revelation 19.9, uh, turn to Revelation 19.9 if you will. And I'll try to run through this real quick because I, <clears throat> Revelation 19, 9, we've been doing Revelation on Sunday evenings. Uh, and he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Don't you know that's a time when the Lord's going to take great delight? And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Listen. When you go through Revelation chapter 9, again, I'm going to skim through this pretty quick, but when you go through Revelation chapter nine, uh, 19, well, the whole book of Revelation, you wind up finding that the, the timeline for man's history is kind of laid out in about 4,000 years in the Old Testament. That's that big block on the left. Uh, about 2,000 years in the church age. There's a seven-year uh, tribulation period. And then the Lord comes back at what we call the second coming, at the end of the tribulation period. And then we go into the day of rest, the seventh uh, day that God rested in the beginning in the creation is called the millennium. In Hebrews, it refers to it over and over again as, as his rest, his rest, his rest, right? Um, so you got 7,000 years in man's history, but at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, right before the millennium, you have something called the second coming or the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is when he comes back and the blood goes up to the horse's bridles when he, you know, gets rid of the Antichrist. The 666 thing gets all gone. That, that all gets uh, taken care of at that point in time right there. Before that time, there's some, uh, there's some raptures that happen. 
Uh, we, all, we know, or, or hopefully you know, that the church gets raptured out before that seven-year tribulation period. I don't have time to go into why I, I believe that, but there's also in the Bible, there's also at least one other rapture that happens during that seven-year tribulation period towards the end, but it's before the second uh, coming, and that's why there's a lot of confusion when people start reading Matthew 24 and, and those passages in there. So we're looking out at the end of this time period, and we see uh, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife hath made herself ready. So the Lord's preparing a, a bride, which would be us, those of us who are saved, born again in the church age. He's uh, preparing a bride, and that bride is going to wind up at the wedding and the judgment seat of Christ during that seven-year tribulation time period. So while the earth is going through the whole business with the Antichrist, you and I, if we're saved, we're going to be up in heaven going through the judgment seat of Christ, getting all that taken care of, and then there's going to be a marriage. Amen? Amen? And, and the bride is going to be uh, you know, adorned, and, and everything that happens around a wedding, it's going to be a grand occasion. Um, but then there's something else that happens after that. The Bible says this, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. After that wedding, there's going to be a supper. You know what the Lord delights in? He delights in dining with you and me, right? Um, and that's going to happen after the second advent. And if you uh, take a look in Luke 22 real quick, I want you to see it. Luke 22 You say, when does, that, uh, when does that marriage supper of the Lamb happen? And where does it happen? Luke 22, take a look at verse uh, 16. And this is the Lord with his disciples, right? Right around the time of the Last Supper. For I say unto you that I will not any more eat thereof. I'm not going to have a meal with you until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Well, that kingdom of God takes, comes back after the second advent. During the millennium, the kingdom of God is down here on this planet. He said unto them, uh, or, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That, that marriage supper of the lamb that he's talking about takes place right after the second coming. We've already done the wedding and the judgment seat of Christ, right? Judgment seat first and the wedding. We come back with the Lord at the second advent and guess what? Once we get all the, the blood and everything uh, taken care of at, the, the, at that battle uh, and the Lord kicks uh, Satan out for a while, binds him for a thousand years, we are down here on this earth and we have a marriage supper of the Lamb. This whole thing revolves around the Lord desiring to have fellowship and dine with us. Amen? The Lord took those 74 guys up to the hill and he dined with them. And then it says back in Genesis, if you will, back in Genesis 24, actually uh, to 25. Listen, the Lord, the Lord definitely desires to deliver you. He definitely desires to have fellowship with you in your Bible, spiritual fellowship. Right? There's physical fellowship that we'll wind up having with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But folks, the Lord desires, the Lord desires to dwell with you. You got this whole thing going on in 24. Those 70 guys go up. They see the Lord. They have that meal. And then you get down to 25, and, and uh, God is giving Moses all these instructions in the next few chapters. Uh, look at the beginning of 25. The Lord spake unto Moses and the children of Israel, uh, that they bring me an offering, every man that he giveth it willingly with his heart. Uh, ye shall take my offering. And then he goes down, and he talks about the offering that the, the people are going to give. And then he says this in verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Folks, you know what we miss? Sometimes in our Christian walk, we just get so carried away with taking care of things down here in this earth. We get... We, our, our prayer time gets set aside, our Bible reading set aside. Some of the things that please God the greatest, that bring him delight, 
we miss because we fail to see how critical and important they really are. The Lord, I mean, we know we got salvation, we know we've been delivered, but the Lord takes delight in dining with us, breaking the word of God out, and for us to learn about him over a meal, just like we would like to with any of our friends. But the Lord also delights in dwelling with you. Amen. The Lord delights in walking with you day in, day out, through your ups, through your downs. Amen. The Lord delights in being right there as, as inside of you if you're saved. You look in the mirror, the Lord's looking back at you. <laughs> the Lord takes delight, folks, in dwelling with you. You got this whole thing going on. The children of Israel, they've messed up already, right? They complained about water. They murmured about, uh, as soon as they got out of, of, of the land of Egypt, oh, I wish we had leeks and garlics, right? In a couple days, they're already murmuring and complaining, but the Lord overlooks all that stuff. He's got them up here. Those 74 guys go up the mountain. He's getting ready to give Moses a 20, uh, the 10, 20 commandments, 10 commandments. <laughs> Almost pulled a Monty Python there for a second, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> the Lord, Lord's got Moses ready to give uh, uh, are ready to give him the Ten Commandments. And the Lord's looking forward to all this, and he knows the people have messed up, and he still desires to dine with them. And in the middle of those instructions, when Moses is up on the mountain, and the people are back down there, he says to Moses, build a sanctuary so that I can dwell among the people. Now, I get it. There are times when the Lord was unhappy with them and he, he set himself aside and said, uh-uh, you better stay away. But you know what the Lord's desire was? See, that was their fault. Amen. If you look through the Bible, any time the Lord drew back and said, okay, uh, I'll just stay back here for a while because I don't want to be a part of that, that was their fault. That was our fault. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what the Lord's desire is? The Lord's desire is to dwell with you. The Lord's desire is to walk with you side by side, closer than that. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Why? Because the Lord's inside of you if you're saved. Yeah. Amen. And the more you walk with the Lord, the more delight you bring him. It's not real, you know, it's, it's not real, real complicated. Solomon said this, but will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? He said that in the process he was building the tabernacle and getting all that stuff ready. You know what the answer is? Yes, he will. <laughs> yeah, he will. One of the first things God does with Moses, before he even gives him those tablets, is he says, take up an offering from the people, build me a sanctuary, because I want to dwell with them. Right? Amen. I will be their God. They shall be my people. In John uh, 2, Jesus answered and said uh, unto them and said this. He said, destroy this temple. Pointing at himself, right? In, in essence. And in three days, I will raise it up. Amen. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in the building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. See, the Lord's got a temple, his body. And it was created to dwell with his people. That was the purpose of the temple, the tabernacle. So he could dwell with his people. So now we move into the New Testament time and we don't have a physical building like they did back in the Old Testament. We have the body of Christ, a spiritual body, but it's got the same purpose. So God can dwell with his people. Amen. That's a comfort to me. It says in, I'm almost done, it says in uh, Ephesians that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. 
I look at that thing and I, I read through the book of Exodus and I see the children of Israel time and time and time again messing things up. I mean, you got to admit, their track record really wasn't all that great coming out of the land of Egypt, right? And in spite of all that, I see a God that has a desire to deliver them. You know what I learned from that? The Lord has a desire to deliver you. I don't know what you need to be delivered from, but I can guarantee you he has a desire to do it. I see the Lord has a desire to dine with you. Many of us look at ourselves and we go, I'm not worthy to sit across a table from him. 73 of those guys that he had dinner with up on that mountain, within a few days, didn't even have enough courage to defend him. Peter, who denies him three times after the Lord told him he was going to deny him three times, and Peter stands up and spouts off, oh, Lord, I'll never deny thee. They can kill me, but uh, uh, uh. Peter denies him three times anyway, just like he said he would. A few days later, the Lord's here, come and dine. Peter's got to go, yeah, Lord. Peter, lovest thou me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. That had to have been the hardest three questions Peter ever had. Can you imagine sitting there in front of the Lord, knowing that you've denied the Lord three times? Knowing that everybody else knows you've denied the Lord three times. Knowing that you were a big hot shot and, you know, blabbed out your mouth, you were never going to do it. And then having to sit there in front of the Lord and the Lord says, uh, you know, the Lord didn't say, he, he could have said to Peter, ah, don't worry about it, forget about it. But he wanted Peter to learn from it. So he sits across from Peter, uh, Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? Yea, Lord. You, oh, of course. Yeah, of course I love you. Peter, lovest thou me? Why are you asking me again, Lord? Don't you, don't you know? You know everything. Don't you know I love you? In the back of the Lord's mind, he's probably going, yeah, I know it. I'm just kind of cementing it in your mind. <laughs> And he asks Peter three times. The same number of times he denied him. The Lord deals with Peter face to face over dinner about Peter's failure at the fire. But he still said to Peter, come and die. See, that's the part that I love. Nobody likes to face the three questions. That's very uncomfortable. I don't care who you are. Even Peter had to, he had to have been kicking the dirt, right? Probably drawn on the, right? If he had a pencil and tablet, he was doodling, I, I promise you. Looking down at the table, doodling. If he had a phone, he was probably texting somebody else, hoping the conversation would go away. Anything to do to get away from those three questions, because those three questions had to really burn. But what was the Lord's desire? He took delight in dining with Peter. It's okay that he had to ask the questions, because the bigger picture was Peter, come and dine. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we decline an invitation to dine because we don't want to answer the questions. <laughs> Peter could have got all the fish off the boat. He was with the other disciples, right? We, I go a fishing, a lot of them went with him. Oh, it's the Lord. <clears throat> okay, I got to clean the nets. You guys go over there and have dinner with him. <laughs> I'm going to be busy about my business. That's the way most of us would handle it. I got something. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to get over there by the fire and sit across from the Lord face to face after what I just did.
But God takes delight even after Peter denied him three times. That's a blessing. Listen, we'll wrap things up here. Reading through Exodus, very familiar passage of Scripture, run across these 74 guys that take this trip up the mountain and they get a chance to see God and they get a chance to dine with God. God's delivered them. God calls them up on the mountain, dines with them. And then the next chapter in 25, he's making plans so that he, that tabernacle, tabernacle can be built and he can dwell with them. And that's what the Lord desires from you and me. You say, I'm unworthy. I don't think you're any less worthy than any of those other guys in the nation of Israel. You say, I do the same things that they did. You ever think maybe that's why God put them in the book so that you'd understand? <laughs> hey, you're just like them. No worse, no better. You just like them. You say, I'm not a murderer. You ever been angry at your brother in his heart? <laughs> in your heart, right? Well, the Lord's got an answer for everything, man. It's just, it's brutal. <laughs> but in spite of all that, with those children of Israel, he took delight in delivering them like he'll take delight in delivering you. He took delight in dining with them like he wants to take delight in dining with you. Open that book up. Get that phone app out. Whatever you got to do. Right? Spend some time dining with the Lord. Right? I want to see the pennies go up. <laughs> because all he really wants is to be in the tabernacle in the midst of the people and dwell with them. Amen. That's what he wants, to be in the midst of the people and dwell with them. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the uh, opportunity to uh, just come together, have the Word of God opened up. Uh, Father, it is amazing the long-suffering and the patience that you displayed with uh, your people uh, we look at the children of Israel, and uh, quite frankly, we see their, just the natural tendency is for us to see all their failures. Um, Father, I'm sure they had a lot of good days as well, but we look at that, and it, it's, it kind of confounds us as to why you would dwell with them the way that you did. But Lord, you're faithful, and your desire was to deliver them, to dine with them, and to dwell with them. Help us to realize that you have the same desire for us. Father, give us the courage to be able to sit across the table from you like Peter did, even in the state that we're in. Because, Lord, you serve some good fish. It's a good meal. And Father, one of these days, we're all looking forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. When all, everything is erased, when all of our sins have been taken care of, when we're out of this body and we're in our new body, when we're glorified, Lord, I am looking forward to the day when I can sit across the table from you then and have a meal, and know you probably in a way that I could never know you as a mortal man in this flesh. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for, uh, for saving us. Uh, Father, I do pray that uh, uh, if there's anybody here that's not saved, I know I didn't spend a whole lot of time on salvation, but Father, if, if there is anyone here that's not saved, I pray that something that was said would have uh, triggered a thought in their mind, would have triggered their heart being pricked, that you deal with them about receiving Jesus Christ. Father, for uh, the saints here, for the, those that are born again, that you just help us to see what things you really do delight in. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.